While we're waiting for Tom Atchison, I can give another kudo to uh, one of my cohorts here on the team. He's been doing an amazing job with logistics. Joel Vinas. Give him a uh, big round of applause. Okay, we're all back, we're all collected, we're all gathered, and we're going to start right in. The next company up is Sabre Astronautics. Ready? Hello, I'm Jason Held on behalf of Sabre Astronautics. I'd like to welcome you to the Predictive Interactive Ground Station Interface. Uh, it's a product which we believe is going to be the next generation in satellite control. Uh, PIGI, as we affectionately call it, is software. It sits on your satellite ground station and it allows your operators to really understand what's going on inside the satellite and uh, also how those insides are affected by everything happening outside that satellite. Armed with this, this information, uh, we believe that it's going to allow you to cut the cost of your uh, mission operations by up to 66%. Now, a bit about us. Uh, we're a small group, but we're packing a lot of punch as far as our technical capabilities are concerned. Uh, we've got guys who worked on Hubble and the ISS. Uh, we've got uh, PhD graduates from the world-class robotics lab at the University of Sydney. And we've got uh, decorated officers from Army and Air Force Space Command. This is the problem. We all talk about reducing the barriers to entry to space, which usually means reducing the cost of launch or the cost of engineering in the satellite. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the cost of your operations actually accounts for up to a third of the cost of your total mission. Right? Looking at this slide, you can see why. There's a lot of contextual information. There's a lot of data. And uh, you know, the more complex the satellite, the more data you get, which means you hire more people. Um, and it's all 2, 2D, so there's no context, which means there's higher costs in labor and satellite downtime and training and insurance. Now, if you could dim the lights, uh, imagine if you would, you are a space operator uh, using Piggy. And forget about text on a screen. Now you're visualizing everything. It's all right in front of your face. You can move around. You could uh, control the scientific information like magnetic field models like you see here. Uh, or you could click on a satellite in your inventory and take a closer look and uh, view the uh, sun ray casting straight to the satellite in the shadows so you get real good situational awareness and environmental information. But what you really want to know is what's happening inside that satellite. So there you go. You could expand it out and look inside the guts. You can isolate different subsystems like your structures or your command and data handling. Uh, or your electric power subsystem, for example. And the important thing here is that you're in control of all the information you really want to see. It's very easy to find. It's there at a click of a button. Uh, but what happens if something goes wrong? Now the system needs to tell you something's going on. So let's say you have a, a solar flare or some other space weather event, and there you go. Components start turning red. Red means there's a defect that needs to be managed. Uh, blue means that there's a defect that happened that uh, you just need to take a look at, but it's recovered. So the point is, is the system is now prompting you for the information that's most important uh, for your mission operations. Okay, now uh, on the back end, we have uh, complex systems models which are proprietary, which are world-class artificial intelligence, which can uh, tell you the cause and effects of all your defects as they cascade through your system. This is important. The stuff on the left-hand side you're seeing is an actual event, space weather event, that happened on the NASA ACE Explorer. On the right-hand side, you see a chart which shows you uh, the output from our model. And as you can see, they're almost exactly the same. It's dead on accurate. Our stuff works, right? So the graph below where you're seeing those circles and, and lines, what that's showing you is the actual variables and what's affecting what. That's showing you that the space weather uh, and all the downstream effects to your satellite components. That's something we hand to our customers. Uh, this AI stuff gives us a unique advantage uh, that we are the first in the world who's able to, to solve this important problem. And this is something that people have been trying to crack on in the mission operations community for the last 20 years. So what it does is understanding these relationships helps you reduce your risk. Uh, and, and reducing risk is to reduce costs. So, uh, there are a wide range of industries that are now paying attention to what we're doing and, and want to partner and collaborate with us. Uh, areas such as tra transportation, finance, and, and energy are just the tip of the iceberg. 
But we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about the uh, satellite market, right? It's a $169 billion market. About 20 to 60 billion is in operations. And let's not forget about uh, the $1 billion satellite insurance market. So uh, we segment this into three different groups. Uh, just think of it as large, medium, and small, but it's large, micro, and nano. Uh, uh, the large market is kind of special because very high dollar value, and it's a fairly stable market. Uh, and they're more interested in, in the diagnostics tools than maybe the graphics at this point, but that's okay because the micro and nano guys, the smaller folk, are more interested in graphics and telemetry services, which for us works out really, really well in our business model because we're looking at an entry to the market uh, by providing telemetry and operations services from Australia. Uh, we're there, we've got boots on the ground, we can support this type of a mission. And uh, using that uh, as development, as, our, as we develop from R&D up into the product state uh, later on in 2014. So how this translates to revenue is uh, we're looking at being cash flow positive with the first microsat sale uh, at the end of year two, and years three, four, and five scale up as we start getting the larger satellites online at about $1.2 million per satellite. Uh, so that gives us some possible strategic exits of uh, yeah, an acquisition, or if we want to, we can sit around for another couple of years and look at an IPO. So in conclusion, Guys, this is a great project. Uh, it's, it's a game changer for the operations community. It's going to save them a lot of money, and we're ready to go today. So thank you for your time. What are your questions? So um, you, you're planning on a single uh, uh, station in Australia for LEO? Yeah, just to start off with, uh, and, and we, we have a, an office, I mean, we are a small company, yeah, so, but we have an office with, uh, uh, it's top floor, third story, we've got great line of sight. Um, For how long? Uh, well, we, we got it till 2014, our lease is no, extendable. I mean, the till. visibility of, uh, particularly with small sats and uh, the other ones, because they're moving pretty quick, right? Yeah, 15 minutes you know, is, is, is pretty normal, right? So... The idea is, is for, for someone who's developing uh, CubeSats, we see a lot of them here today, right. uh, they got to communicate in this part of the world. So their options are they could talk to uh, the Chinese or the Russians or the Indonesians, or along that track, we're in great position. Right. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm positioning myself as an ally to right. these groups here in the United States. Right. But your service availability is going to be limited by the constellation that's above your base station. Always. Period of time. Always, <laughs> yeah. yeah. In your... Uh, Plan right up. You said that you were under uh, discussion with Optus in Australia to try an experiment with them in August for trying yes. your software with them. The uh, question was, is, is that on track for an August demo, and what exactly yes. are you going to try to do with them? Uh, well, I can't talk in too many details about that. That's something that I really wanted to keep only on the business plan <laughs> that, that you guys saw. But uh, you know, cats out of the bag. You know, uh, Look, we have, we have plans to... Uh, take some data that they have that's old and repeat the experiment that we did on the NASA ACE uh, Explorer, right? So the, the NASA ACE is Advanced Composition Explorer. It's a space weather satellite, which is really good for us because we're able to make the connections between the space weather that, that's happening, uh, that it's receiving on its sensors and the actual effects on the satellite itself, and it, it worked great. So they're interested in seeing if, that, if we could repeat that for one of their satellites that, that they know where the defects were and see if we could recreate that. I wanted to delve into the, the market size estimates a little bit more. Uh, we deal a lot with the geosynchronous satellites, and, and there, depending on the size of your fleet, you're spending $1 million to $2 million per year on flight operations mm -hmm. um, and maybe 1% on, on in-orbit insurance. Uh, you know, you're talking about a $1 million plus per satellite. Uh, I just... You know, how, have you tested that price point? Um, what sort of uh, interest or pushback are you getting from from the, the commercial satellite we're, industry? We're, we're not pushing any price point to our potential customers yet. The discussion mm -hmm. is let's see if it works, mm -hmm. because there's um, especially for what we're proposing. Since people have been been failing at solving it for so long, there's kind of a uh, you know people want to see it work first before we talk price. But the 1.2 million comes mm -hmm. from. Uh, previous discussions I had on the operations side was when I was an Army Space Support Team officer, mm -hmm. trying to do this from the other side of the, the coin, the offers that we were getting mm -hmm. uh, to do um, mission operations software without any predictive capability, 
was roughly within this range. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand your, your point that customers might have a different pricing point. We're going to explore that as we go on. So, not being a technical person, yeah. um, the, you, there's no way to retrofit sa satellites so you can, you can um, get the status of existing satellites, right? You, like, here's a simple so way to think about it. So your market is the future no, no. satellites that are being launched. Yeah, is that here, what here, here's, the thing, here's the way to think about it very, very simply to understand contextually the, 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 the technology. Right now, everybody knows what happens on a satellite. You get telemetry. You get a lot of information. You put it on this 2D screen, and it lists. And if it does have automated alerts. If there's something wrong, yeah, you're sitting on your cup of coffee, and an alarm goes off, you run to the, to the, to the monitor. Uh, but it doesn't tell you why. So for example, the Hubble Space Telescope team would, would they, they have their screen like the matrix looking for a word to turn red. And if something happened, then the whole team would gather together and spend hours, days, in some cases, cases weeks with Excel spreadsheets trying to find correlations for a very complicated, dynamic, emergent system. And a lot of the times it comes down to intuition because that's how we as human beings try and mitigate this problem. And uh, what I'm saying is that we've got a system that's able to automate that whole thing for them. So, so. so for instance, in that example with the yeah. Hubble telescope, could you have told them what was wrong? With this, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, related to that validation test on the ACE data that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, that spacecraft was launched in 97, so the electronics are probably 95 vintage at best. And uh, my question is, is during the 16 days you were testing that data against your models and whatnot, uh, did they have any anomalies? And if they had anomalies and your system was plugged in, mm -hmm. could they have done anything with that new knowledge of what happened? Okay, I, I love this question, actually, because this is kind of cool. Uh, the, um, we didn't test it over 16 days. We gathered the data over 16 days, about two weeks worth to train models, right? And we trained it on the 2003 uh, space weather event, which was one of the biggest events of its, of its time. And we then tested it on data all through the next five years. So, so what that tells you, oh, sorry, eight years. So the 2011 space weather event, the, the models were still accurate. So what that tells you is that this model was time invariant. So the model that was formed in 2003 was still valid time after time after time up until very, the very last point. Now, I, I don't want to oversell it. Because, I mean, it, as, as far as research, there's a lot in here which is still quite new. And there are anomalies and, and errors here and there that we're finding, and, and that, that's just part of the process. But the fact that we were able to successfully do that and that the models are still valid eight years later uh, is a pretty strong statement. So, All right. thanks. Okay. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> All right, next up, Space Ground Amalgam. Thank you. That's it. Great. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Sanford. I'm the president and founder of Space Ground Amalgam, and I'm here today to talk to you about inflatable and rigidized antennas for satellites. Applications like high definition television, mobile television, fast internet, and mobile computing are driving insatiable demand for bandwidth. In satellites, size does matter. Big antennas equal the ability to support many customers and drive large amounts of revenue. Small structures for launch and low mass drive low cost and efficiency. So it, it works against both ends. And advances in material and chemical sciences, along with advances in shared memory polymers and nanomaterials, are enabling a new way for inflatable materials to support requirements in the market today. Our bottom line upfront ask 
beyond being able to scale to any frequency and an antenna requirement is for three and a half million dollars to fund development of two antennas. By the way, with the sale of two antennas, we are profitable and returning about 114% to our investors. Our team is comprised of leaders in the marketplace that have successfully transitioned terrestrial technologies for use in space. We have expertise that spans mechanical structures for satellites, subsystem design, and over a half dozen nanosatellite developments over the past five years. Our go-to-market partner is Lagarde. They're an early pioneer and current innovator in the, uh, in the inflatable business, and, uh, and they have agreed to explore the research and development phase as well as go to market with us. And importantly, with our partnership with NanoRex and their Space Act Agreement, we have the ability to test our systems aboard the International Space Station uh, post-launch. According to the 2011 Space Report produced by the Space Foundation, high-definition television and mobile next-generation applications are driving about a three-fold increase in bandwidth requirements from data communication satellites. 3D television, which is coming, demands over six times the bandwidth required for uh, links to close. Advanced materials, nano, um, nanomaterials and, uh, and polymers, as well as new techniques to optimize post-rigidization, which is the process of inflating the antenna chemically or uh, with, uh, with UV uh, rays, rigidizing the structure so it becomes permanent upon launch. Uh, are enabling us to, to look at this technology uh, along with uh, software optimization uh, uh, post-deployment. This helps our partners in the satellite operators and, and, uh, and developers reduce deployment risks for complex mechanisms associated with big antennas. Comparing the rigid, the old inflatable, and the new inflatable, first off, the price points fit within the current budget. The costs, however, drop by roughly one half, which increases margin and gives us greater flexibility on the, on, the, on the development side. I want to talk about risk. This team has success in addressing, new, in addressing risks of new technology in the conservative satellite marketplace. For example, being able to fly 12 million lines of software code in space versus 200,000, which was considered the industry norm, as well as success developing new processes for, um, uh, for the way we go to market with uh, new technology. And speaking of the market, our initial market is about $1 billion per year. And as I said, to begin with, selling two units by 2016 puts us in a cash flow positive position with 114% ROI. We're gonna establish beachhead accounts with known operators and manufacturers in the communications world because that's the market that we know. However, that market with that approach and this opportunity only addresses about roughly one third of the addressable market. Broadcast, the broadcast to market, including the 3D television, is a six, uh, six times demand increase. There are, there's a market for additional components and new markets, in particular for this, for this group of organizations, looking at deep space communications. Uh, imagine being able to land um, uh, a vehicle on the moon, let the dust settle, inflate and rigidize a large reflector. Uh, gigabit capacity from the moon and beyond are a reality with this technology. The chart on the right is a notional growth chart over the next 10 years, showing a very conservative scale opportunity tied with this technology. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Um, a, a couple of questions. When I was reading the business plan, one of the things that I, I was a little confused by, I guess, was it seemed like you were buying an awful lot of your technology and wasn't sure what you were actually creating. Right, so uh, great question. And, uh, and the point in this market, the challenge is blending sort of the old tried and true market with, with the new market uh, and new opportunity. And so leveraging existing uh, technology and capabilities to the extent possible is important. Um, the development here has to do with, uh, with the techniques around rigidization 
the techniques around optimizing post-rigidization for very high precision uh, demands associated with KA band 30 gigahertz types frequencies. Um, the, the precision with inflatable technology to date has not allowed us to, uh, to be able to support uh, those, uh, those very high bandwidth, or sorry, high precision requirements. So the innovation and the development uh, and, the, and the patent discussion talks around uh, that technique to be able to do that for large reflectors. Okay. Um, and can you do it with solar arrays as well as antennas? Yes, ma'am. So the uh, so the, the, the there's uh, the research is is required there. Uh, how we manage heat becomes a, becomes an issue with solar arrays. But uh, absolutely, inflatable uh, inflatable structures, booms, um, arrays, and antenna structures. There are some patents, by the way, that Honeywell owns right now uh, are around some of those in particular. But uh, yes, solar arrays and uh, and any structures that you look at today, um, uh, there are, there is potential to uh, to look at using rigid components uh, that are inflatable. White. Rick, uh, huge market opportunity. Obviously, uh, I, I think as you just stated, the the key risk seems to be the ability to to tune it, the surface of the reflector to high precision after it's been rigidized. Can you? Give us a little more comfort on why you think that's a risk you're going to be able to uh, to overcome and, and Yes, so um, without being too specific, obviously, um, there are techniques and tools that uh, that are understood in the industry uh, for being able to um, uh, to compensate in software for surface deviations and uh, and being able post rigidization to analyze that and uh, and and build some software that uh, that that compensates very high level. Yeah, related question, Rick. Um, I can appreciate that, like Lagarde, could make a perfect reflector, you know, at, at least within the specs you need. But when you talk about putting that huge reflector on the end of booms or struts or supports or whatever it is that gets it out there, uh, when you talk about booms in your market here, is that the kind of boom you're talking about to hold that reflector out there, or would you always have that reflector on the end of composite tubes or something? Because that also, those booms also need to be as precise as the reflector, otherwise you're off. That's correct. And so, and so it's important to note that in the plan and with the plan that I've articulated today, um, the structure, the support, um, how those pieces uh, play together, uh, the answer is all of the above and perhaps both. It will depend on the bus that we're flying on, the size of the bus, the structure that's there, the availability to support uh, the interface, um, uh, I, I spoke about new process, and this is in, in particular what I'm talking about. So I don't have the specific answer for you, uh, but that's part of the R&D that needs to go on uh, over the next three years uh, for, this, for this development. Yes, I had, sir. A, I had a quick question about kind of a materials related yes. issue. Um, because you're using a quite different material technology uh, that's involved, how is the lifetime of that compared to the satellite lifetimes with the existing technology that's there? Is it comparable? It's comparable. Is it a longer, longer life cycle, shorter life cycle, it, given the space environment? It's, it's comparable. And, it, and in fact, uh, it's important to note that we're focusing on the geosynchronous um, uh, environment, which mm -hmm. is much less harsh. Right. Um, Post-rigidization, uh, the technologies and the materials that we're using um, would fit well well within the the twelve year design life cycle of the average geostationary right, right, but, but satellite extension is always a very attractive that's option correct. that's out there, and there's a lot of folks working on that, and so that's you correct. would expect these materials to still ex extend beyond that, or, or, or so that's that might put an end to satellite extension capability. That's beyond my uh, ability to answer at this point in time. Uh, I can absolutely find the answer for you, but I don't I don't know the right. Yeah, now. lots of people once they get them out there and working like to keep them. So. Absolutely right, but you know the question is, is there enough margin to, to go 15 years? Uh, or, or longer uh, can absolutely provide that answer for you. Quick question about your test uh, plan that yes. you described with nano racks. Yes. On the one hand, you're trying to validate a very large antenna that's maybe bigger than anything that has been up there recently. Correct. But nano racks is focused on nano, you know, small yes. stuff. So, do you know how big you could get nano racks to? Uh, support a demo, you know, like how, bi how big of a demo, and is it so, scalable to what you really need? So it's a, a excellent question, Rex. So the, the, uh, the test environment on the International Space Station is the external platform program, which comes online in 2014. And the, th the specifics of the mechanics, uh, first off, the, uh, the up mass and down mass is via the Space Act Agreement on any of the launchers that are there. Um, uh, the, the infrastructure is, is aboard the space station so to support our on-orbit testing. Uh, the question of how big of a reflector will we, will we, will we be able to deploy, um, it probably won't be 10 meters. 
um, and we're still in early stage conversation about that. Uh, what, we want to what we want to test is uh, specifically our ability to rigidize, map the surface, um, uh, and do some, some performance analysis based on that, even on a small scale, to burn down risk. We're in the hostile environment in LEO. Well, it's not really hostile at that point, but um, more rigorous than what we see in GEO. And so we're taking a phased approach on the test side. And, and again, it's the reason the ask is to build the, uh, the test unit and then two production units uh, post that. The other question that you may be thinking about, I just want to add this, is what does the customer want? And uh, we do have letters of interest from two satellite manufacturers uh, right now. And uh, we need to be in conversation with them about what their specific requirements are so we, then we can design what our first product really needs to do. Thank you. Fancy they make the thing, Windows is still clumsy. And we go there. All right. Next up is Terra Pio. Good morning. I'm Elizabeth Leffel representing Terra Pio today. And I'd like to talk to you about a unique opportunity to get involved in the development of a new therapeutic to treat radiation sickness. This is important because right now, no treatment exists. When individuals are exposed to ionizing radiation, they will get radiation sickness due to cell damage. This can cause cataracts, multiple organ damage, and cancer. In the general population, people are exposed to ionizing radiation, possibly from a deliberate terror attack or nuclear accidents and the cleanup thereafter. Clearly, space tourists are at high risk, in addition to astronauts, for um, radiation sickness due to solar flares or cosmic rays. In fact, on the space station, when an astronaut spends six months, they've received equivalent doses of radiation of 480 chest X-rays. The average person in a year receives approximately equivalents of two chest X-rays. The solution is RLIP76. We have phenomenal non-clinical efficacy data for this product. When mice have been irradiated with multiple lethal doses of radiation and then treated with our RLIP76 protein, there's greater than 96% survival compared to 20% in untreated controls. That's shown in the graph on the left. The graph on the right shows you that if you use a very small dose of RLIP76 and administer it an entire day, 24 hours after lethal doses of radiation, there's still 100% survival in treated mice. The human recombinant RLIP76 protein is produced by E. coli fermentation. The drug is then formulated into proteoliposomes by a scalable process. It's incredibly efficacious in acute doses to high exposure radiation. In addition to that, we think it's going to be very effective for long-term therapy because it's a naturally occurring protein. There aren't suspected toxic side effects, which is always a risk when you're developing a drug, and we think FDA licensure will not be a problem. Now that you know the problem is there's no treatment for radiation sickness, and the solution is RLIP76, let's talk about how it works. This is a cartoon of a healthy cell. Reactive oxygen species and other metabolites are produced during natural mechanisms. The RLIP76 is a transport protein in the membrane that takes these toxic components out of the cell. When a cell is exposed to injury, such as ionizing radiation, these toxic metabolites build up, overwhelming the RLIP76 transport system. Our encapsulated proteoliposome adds to the RLIP76 that's already in the cell, allowing the transport system to work more efficiently and basically detoxifying the cells. 
Our current customers are primarily the United States government. The various agencies are shown here. There is an opportunity for the international market, but within the United States, it's anticipated there's about a $700 million a year market. In fact, BARDA alone has awarded $56 million in contracts to only five companies, and we believe we would receive similar or even greater awards because RLIP 76 has a very unique mechanism of action. In addition to that mechanism of action being unique, it allows us to have multiple medical applications, not only as a radiation or a chemical countermeasure, but in diseases of the CNS and oncology. Our LIP76 can be repurposed from an oncology supportive medication into a radiation countermeasure, which also makes it attractive to the government. Our future market would be space tourism or space settlements, which is anticipated to be a billion dollar industry in less than 10 years. Terapio expects charging $2,500 a week to a space tourist for prophylactic RLIP-76 treatment. Of course, astronauts are the critical unmet need that we're most interested in, even though it's a smaller number of people. Long-term space travel or space walks have high risk to radiation exposure. NASA, of course, would receive a highly discounted rate on price per dose, being a government agency, and being able to repurpose the drug in the strategic national stockpile that's managed by the Centers for Disease Control. Our path to FDA approval will be via the animal rule. Because it's unethical to test efficacy of our drug in people, you can't expose people to ionizing radiation just to test your drug, we'll be using animal models. And this requires us to get an investigational new drug license by the beginning of 2014 which will move into clinical trials and have FDA licensure by the end of 2016. Either of these points would be possible exit strategies by acquisition of the company, but the most lucrative one would be FDA licensure. When we deliver the medical countermeasure to the strategic national stockpile, that'll be the opportunity for the most revenue, but more importantly, it's the best opportunity for someone to have been involved in the development of the licensure of the very first treatment for radiation sickness. Our CEO has been a CEO of five successful biotechnology firms. In addition, he's an aerospace engineer and greatly understands the application that this could be for NASA. Our key partners include private industry, state and federal government, and universities. In conclusion, our key milestones have been the completion of 50 non-clinical efficacy trials where we've had really good clinical data and great um, prospects of taking this to clinical trials. We have increased production by 50 times, making this a scalable manufacturing process. And we expect our first revenue in 2016 at FDA licensure. Our request for Series B financing is $10 million to match the federal government revenue. And we estimate $15 million in Series C investment to get us to FDA licensure in 2016. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. I guess I'll start. Okay. Um, I think this is very interesting. I guess I have two questions. Um, the first one is, I know you, you obviously can't test on people unless they're already exposed to radiation. And so is there potential for people to offer themselves as guinea pigs if the only other alternative is death? <laughs> Um, there is if we have a clinical protocol written ahead of time and have already gotten our investigational new drug license. Um, so we're a couple years away from doing that, but yes, that's a possibility. The other attraction is if we do pursue an oncology supportive medication, we would obviously have clinical trials in real people with problems and that data could support the radiation countermeasure application. And would it, would it take, you know, the cataracts and things like this, would they take those away? And how does it come out, out the radiation come out of your system? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think it would take the, the cataracts away. That um, would be prevention is what you would be looking at in something like cataracts. Um, and it wouldn't actually reduce the radiation level in your body. It would just help the cells detoxify and then prevent further cell death and further cell damage. So once the damage has happened, RLIP 76 probably could not rescue that. Uh, two questions. One, for the space application, you're talking about persistent, long-term, 24-7 radiation exposure as opposed mm -hmm. to an event that you then detoxify from. Right. So can you talk a little bit about the efficacy of your drug for, you know, continual, you, you may take it for six months or even longer if you're going to Mars, right? If you're taking it every day for 
for three years. Um, what do you think happens to the, you know, the cell structures or whatever? Um, and then uh, second question, uh, you talked about a price point of say $2,500 for uh, per week for space tours, mm -hmm. and that's obviously small percentage of what they're paying for uh, for the ride. Um, but what, talk a little bit about the margins, what it will cost you when you scale to you know produce a week's worth of uh, okay of the chemical. Okay, first question: taking it for long term for six, twelve, eighteen months. Um, if we were to pursue that application, we would have to do longer term toxicology studies, and we have planned. Um, right now, we have given, in some of our non-clinical studies, up to nine doses without seeing adverse events in the mice. Um, that's given it from something between every six hours up to every 18 or 24 hours. Um, I would expect that there would be no problems taking it for longer terms. Um, NASA has done a lot of research in just given basic antioxidants prophylactically because this is a naturally occurring protein that's in your cells anyway it shouldn't be any problems taking it long term. Um, the second question was projections of cost for scale up. Well, uh, profit margin. Has, profit has margin. Been. Okay. Um, perhaps we have estimated too low of a possible cost we could charge per dose, um, but that would the twenty five hundred dollars a week per dose would we have expected would certainly carry us with a very good profit margin. Um, the actual percentage that was calculated of a difference of a profit margin, I would have to look that up. I don't know that. Um, the, uh, the whole story here sounds very compelling. You know, we've got terrific progress so far with the data, with the mice, you have the IP coverage, you've got the partners, all that, and you've had mm -hmm. something like over $10 million in financing already. And That's right. I didn't see anything in your plan write up or even here that suggests what this $100,000 prize here would help you do to make any more progress than you're already making. And I'm just wanting to hear something about how this would help you out. Okay, can I go back slides? I'll sh it, it's just better if you see this visual. Um, halfway down the slide, you see the long bar that says toxicology studies. That's all performed in animals, and there are a series of five to eight studies that have to be performed to get that IND licensure, the small block, to allow you to go to clinical trials. The $100,000 would help accelerate that toxicology block. Um, we could do more studies in parallel, so we you know, may be able to do three or four in parallel and shorten that block in half rather than doing them sequentially. Anything else? Thank you. Getting better at these turnovers. Okay. Next up is Terminal Velocity Aerospace. Thanks. Terminal Velocity Aerospace is directly addressing two markets in the space industry. The first of those is for reentry data, and that has uh, application to help improve safety for launch vehicle stages and spacecraft as they reenter. The second market is for small payload return, which has application to increase utilization of outer space. We're serving these markets through our uh, suite of small reentry devices, or REDs, and the first of those is called Red Data, and it is currently available. It essentially is like a black box recorder for a spacecraft that survives during a reentry event. The team consists of myself, Dominic DePasquale, Dr. Robert Braun, and Dr. John Olds. Between the three of us, we have over 60 years of experience in the aerospace industry, and Dr. Robert Braun is one of the world's leading experts in, uh, pl in planetary reentry. The market need for reentry data arises out of the fact that we really do not understand what is happening during a reentry and breakup event. And because of that, it creates risk and it forces us to be conservative. 
So there are several opportunities that are available, and we've spoken with uh, several potential customers in the both commercial as well as government sector who have uh, indicated that they have a high interest in, in this reentry data to either improve their reentry risk predictions, uh, to design their spacecraft to intentionally break up so that it doesn't cause hazard to people and property on the ground, uh, or to design their vehicle so that it does survive, so that it is reusable. Um, there's also the benefit of extending the on-orbit life of satellites. Satellites currently carry some propellant that they must use in order to intentionally deorbit themselves at the end of their lifetime. But if we better understood what was happening during reentry, we'd be able to allow those satellites to stay on orbit longer. And the revenues that these satellites typically generate are on the order of several hundred thousand to several million dollars per month. So this is a significant benefit. The solution that we are offering is called Red Data. What Red Data is is essentially a basketball-sized device. It rides along with the customer's launch vehicle stage or spacecraft, travels to space, and when that stage or spacecraft has completed its mission and deorbits, the Red Data device wakes up, and it begins uh, collecting data during the reentry and breakup event. It collects pressure and temperature and accelerations and so on. Uh, it survives reentry and then it broadcasts or transmits the data that it's collected back to us at Terminal Velocity Aerospace, which we then deliver to the customer. The enabling technology for this is uh, called the Reentry and Breakup Recorder, which was developed at the Aerospace Corporation in partnership with NASA Ames. Several million dollars have gone into this. Uh, Reber was successfully flight proven on the HTV-2 uh, vehicle and there are currently two more demonstration units of the Reber that are on orbit that will return with the ATV and HT vehicle, HTV vehicles, uh, respectively. Um, Reber is the underlying technology for uh, our first product, Red Data. But Red Data also serves as a springboard for us to offer other uh, products and, and, and services. And the first of those that we are currently working on is called Red Sensor. It's in the sa safety and data category on the left side of your screen here. Um, essentially what that is is wireless sensors distributed throughout the host vehicle so that we can collect a much more robust and high quality data set. We're also working on miniaturization of Red Data and Red Sensor. I said that these things are basketball sized devices. We can get them down to softball size so that they can be much more easily integrated uh, with our customer vehicles. Um, in the utilization and payload category, currently available, we have uh, a device called Red Test, and essentially what that is is the Red Data Core, but it allows our customer to put uh, their own thermal protection material or uh, small electronics, whatever sort of uh, small space technology they, they want to test and, and qualify, which is a huge deal in the space industry. And then we are working on a device called Red Treasure, which will be a recoverable version to return um, small novelty items from space. We're doing this through our R&D relationships with the Georgia Tech Space Systems Design Lab and the Aerospace Corporation. In terms of revenue, a key part of our uh, business model is low investment to first dollar. We need um, to sell only two red data units in order to be cash flow positive, and then our projections show that we can have revenues of about $5 million by uh, the end of the sixth year. Total revenue potential is around $21 million per year for the products that I showed on the previous page, um, and there are others that uh, we're also working on. The uh, amount of investment that we are seeking today is simply $150,000. And what that does is it allows us to pay for some of the non-recurring uh, expenses associated with production of the first red data unit. It also has the benefit of unlocking or activating uh, grant funds that can go to the Georgia Tech Space Systems Design Lab to be used on development of these other uh, devices, miniaturization, as well as development of, of Red Treasure. Um, we can provide, or we're forecasting, a 20x return on this $150,000 within the six-year time frame, and the most likely exit scenario for the investor would be, would be buyout. So they would own an interest in the company, and we would um, buy that back. Earlier exits are possible at a lower uh, rate of return. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, can you help me understand again how um, understanding or uh, how having a better comprehension of the deorbit process 
uh, with the vehicle is actually going to provide on-orbit life extension, particularly, I would imagine, at GEO, where, where that's of real value. I'm not sure I'm understanding that connection. Yes. Uh, this would not have an application at GEO. It would be okay, for, so for LEO, LEO satellites only, right? Okay. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I uh, appreciate this whole concept, uh, partly because it's simple and proven already by the Aerospace Corporation experiment, also because of these adjacent markets that are pretty obvious when you start talking about other things. Uh, one market you didn't touch on too heavily, but I think it could blossom in the next decade is uh, early sample return from research going up on Space Station or on Dragon Lab or on Bigelow modules. And to get those back from some plat platform like that, you need a deorbit propulsion module of some sort to, to slow you down. And have you sized that or looked at that about how you would get something to pop off space station without riding along with some other vehicle and just pop off deorbit itself and come back down? And yeah. How big would that be? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good question. Um, we've done some preliminary analysis of that ourselves at terminal velocity. Um, and currently, Georgia Tech is going to the next level of analysis on that. Um, certainly, there are, there are two, I think, sort of enabling technologies. One is the deorbit, and one is recoverability and, and how you uh, do that exactly. So yeah, we think it needs to scale up um, to be on the order of like a 30 kilogram size uh, device. Um, in terms of the, and that would be chemical propulsion um, deorbit and uh, parachute recovery, so kind of the uh, lowest, um, uh, or highest TRL technologies. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, what users would want to use your reentry uh, as a sort of flight qualification or testing platform versus, say, uh, what Nanorax is planning to do with this external rack on the mm -hmm. space station? Sort of what business do you get? What business do they get? How do you split up the market? Okay, great question. We want to provide the service of either returning that the payload on Nanorax, you know, 1U or 2U experiment. You open this thing up, you put it inside, you put it out the airlock, and we'll return and recover it. Uh, that's the, the station payload recovery kind of um, service. Uh, in terms of the, the test, the red test service, um, again, we want to provide this platform. So you as a customer would come to us and you would say, hey, I have this new thermal protection material. Um, and I want to put it on your um, test vehicle. And I have uh, already found a lot of interest for that. Um, I was over uh, talking to the Japanese Space Agency, and that's actually their number one interest. Um, uh, earlier this week, I was at uh, NASA Ames, and uh, they are um, about to uh, finalize arc jet testing on a con new conformal TPS that's a felt-based silicone ablator. And uh, they are looking for opportunities to, to, to flight qualify it, essentially. And so it's people like that that, that have these new um, technologies that we'd be able to work with, yeah. Um, I, I can see markets particularly, as Rex said, in sample returns and also your testing. I'm a little confused about why somebody would want to send cremains to the space and have them come back, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, uh -huh. the, but more than anything else, I don't understand the IP. If Ames and Aerospace develop this, how are you, like, how, what IP is yours? Okay, yeah, I, I should have clarified that. Um, we hold an exclusive uh, license to uh, the technology as well as to the patent. And the patent is for um, any device which returns along with a host vehicle um, and transmits data. So that covers red data as well as red sensor. Um, and there's a couple others that I list there in the, in the business plan that you, you may have seen that are more along the lines of a true black box recorder for a crewed vehicle or something like that. Um, it also covers, covers that. Um, so we've licensed that technology and the relationship with Aerospace Corporation calls for continued sharing. So um, Red Sensor I mentioned is, is currently in development. Uh, Aerospace Corporation is actually doing uh, a lot of that work right now and we would look to um, commercialize it. Does that answer your question? I had one question. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, maybe to add to that, I, I do think at the same time we are going to be generating our own intellectual property that would come out of Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech um, will do some development of some of these devices to a certain stage, at which point terminal velocity would have to, have to take over um, and 
bring it to the kind of detailed design uh, level. Yeah, so there would be our own IP that's generated. That was the question I was going to ask about because it looks like you're making a pretty good investment in Georgia Tech uh, to do a lot of the development here, and yet those are going to be key team members uh, with knowledge and expertise in here. Um, are they going to be coming on board with you later? Is that your thought? Or I mean, have you? Is this? Are we talking about Georgia Tech professors who've got tenure and a very comfortable situation? And what's the risk pieces there for the team with you if you can't find those guys? Sure. Uh, well, uh, Bobby's time. Our chief technical officer, Bobby Braun, his time. Uh, is somewhat split between his responsibilities at Georgia Tech and his responsibilities as chief technical officer within our company. Um, he has uh, graduate students that are working on this project now, and the ideal situation would be that one or more of these graduate students uh, essentially transitions with the technology that has been developed into uh, our, our company. Mm -hmm. And with the people that we have and the timelines that we're looking at, um, that seems like it could be a, a realistic situation. But if you're fully funded, he's not going to leave Georgia Tech? Uh, I can't totally s speak to that. I mean, well, I'm not it, trying to make any news here. I'm just, it's, it's a big yeah. team risk issue, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, you're, in, you're investing in some people, and they're going to be a core part of your organization, and other people are going to want yes. to invest in that as well. Yes, absolutely. And, but uh, um, to be clear, though, Bobby is highly involved, uh, especially on the technical side. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. go. Last up, Unreasonable Rocket. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Breed. Um, I'm with Unreasonable Rocket. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur who's been trading I've built multiple uh, engineering organizations and uh, done entrepreneurial development in fields in everything from Formula One boats to consumer products to full military qualified products. Uh, I'm here today to tell you how we're going to get to space uh, in an inexpensive manner. Uh, snapshot. Uh, the, the concept is to provide nanosat launch. I mean, a third of the people who presented before me need nanosat launch as part of their business. Um, they need it in a scheduled, predictable way. There are over 250 nanosats waiting for a ride. Uh, industry projects 100 a year. Um, the present nanosat launch scheme is very similar to hitchhiking. Uh, I'm going to show you a plan that's cash flow positive at the end of two years. Um, you know, I'm not a slideware company. My slides aren't great. I have real hardware to show. Um, you know, I've been building real hardware for a long time, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, all nanosats today launch as secondary payloads. That's a hitchhiker, meaning the primary payload sets the schedule, sets the orbit, and sets all the other parameters. Uh, how many people came to the conference today hitchhiking? don't see any hands. It's free. Why didn't you hitchhike? You know, um, it's because there are risks and costs other than the cost of the ride. You can't pick your orbit. You can't look dangerous, much less be dangerous. So we had a guy talking about secondary propulsion. I don't think getting the primary payload to accept your secondary propulsion is going to be quite as easy as he made it seem. Uh, you can't control the schedule. If your primary payload is delayed for a year, you have to hold your team together for a year while the primary payload dithers around. That will cost more than what I'm going to charge for a full launch. I mean, you can't do iterative development. You can't fly constellations if you can't control the schedule. Um, so why now? Uh, Nanosats started out as an educational curiosity. There are now businesses that have launched multiple satellites for revenue-paying customers accomplishing real missions. They don't like two-year launch uncertainty and schedule weirdness. They want certainty. 
Uh, there are new manufacturing technologies such as 3D printing, automated winding that lets a small team build things that would have taken hundreds of people in the past. Uh, we wish to leverage that. Um, the first round of private commercial enterprises are happening now. We've got SpaceX, Planetary Resources, Virgin Galactic. I like to say um, NASA is IBM, SpaceX made a really nice deck VAX, and I want to be the Apple II. And if you see the vehicles across the bottom, the rightmost picture is them sitting in my garage. Uh, both of those have flown. Um, the technical approach. A very, very simple 3U CubeSat launcher pressure fed. Automated construction of wound tanks and structures. It's industry standard method of developing wound tanks. I can go over that later. 3D printed motors. This 3D printed stainless motor has got over 20 minutes of firing time. I think it's the first ever regeneratively cooled biprop 3D printed motor fired in the history of the world. Um, automated mission control. Um, this was the mission control box with the automated checklist that we flew our LLC vehicle with. You know, I can drop it on the ground and kick it, and it, it's pretty much bulletproof, but it goes through all the pages of the checklist automatically. It says you're ready, you're not ready. Um, the concept is to launch from a fishing boat. You put the thing in a sealed culvert pipe at the factory, you drop it in the water, you back away, it floats upright like a spar buoy, you launch it. Quarterly scheduled launch, 400K if you go on our launch campaign, meaning if there are five people ready to go, we'll launch five people on that and charge them 400K. If you want a schedule of your own, it's 600K. Uh, we've built and flown prototype versions of most of the pieces necessary. Uh, here are some of our wound tanks. We've, done, we've dealt with the FAA with regulation. Um, the global market is a many billion dollar market. I could stand up here and ask for a hundred million dollar check to address that uh, directly and you'd laugh at me correctly. Uh, this plan achieves that end goal by addressing the first profitable plateau, the sort of smallest plateau that can be done and achieve cash flow positive. Uh, initial plateau is 10 million a year or 25 launches. Uh, we've got some competition. Here's a curve of actual actual CubeSat launches following a nice exponential. Uh, the business fundamentals, 400 and 600K price points, 125K vehicle cost, 50% gross margin, cash flow positive at the end of year two. Do cash flow funded growth to become a large company. Not The exit plan is to build a viable business. Um, we're showing revenues in the $10 million range at the end of four years. Uh, cash flow positive at the end of year two. And we're looking for about a million and a half dollars that gets us to cash flow positive. One third capital, one third operating expenses, one third salary. As founder, I will take no salary until the company is cash flow positive and will continue to contribute 150K a year during development. And uh, we're ready for questions. Can you hand that to them? There, is that better? There, now I've got the mic on. So yeah, I just handed some hardware you can pass around and look, so go ahead. So um, one of the questions I had, you know, one of the key aspects it seems of your technology is the 3D printing technology here for metals. But at, at what size can you actually scale this? Because I mean, this is a nice model demonstrator, but you're gonna need a lot of That's actually model. the size that the third stage motor would be for a 3U launcher. It would have a larger expansion cone, but that's actually about 80 pounds thrust, which is about right for a dedicated 3U launcher. And, but how big will this scale? Um, planning, presently, the present technology can go into about a 10 inch cube, which gets you uh, about an order of magnitude. So another, um, uh, you know, 30 kilograms instead of, or 60 kilograms instead of six. Uh, the technology is evolving. Okay. First stage probably would have a more traditional construction. 
Yeah, uh, by the time you had to cut off and freeze your business plan right up, I think since then uh, Virgin Galactic announced a new dedicated... Yeah, I, I had a pitch in my business plan about why Virgin Galactic wouldn't be in there. Uh, yeah. I can address that with um, the slides on competition. Uh, one of the problems with Virgin Galactic and x -Core is they're going to be um, really secondary payloads because they're manned vehicles. So they're going to have restrictions on safety and things like that that uh, are going to be very similar to the secondary payload restrictions. Right now, Virgin Galactic is planning to stage out of uh, New Mexico. No one has ever gotten an FAA launch license for uh, interior launch. Uh, so they're, if they're going to do launch, they're going to have to set up a base someplace on a coast. Uh, they're also in the $10 million launch rate price, not the five six hundred k launch price. Could you uh, summarize for us the, the test program you've already had and what still needs to be done in terms of uh, what your rocket has achieved and you know, okay. where it needs to go? So we have a bunch of pieces of, we have flown guided liquid propellant vehicles for the Lunar Lander Challenge. Uh, the primary complexities that we don't have from that are we need to get the mass fractions, which is largely dependent on tanks, and we've partnered uh, with Microcosm to develop very lightweight tanks. We have tanks in hand that have the mass fraction necessary to do this. This is one of our structural test items. Uh, we haven't done staging and we haven't done supersonic aerodynamics, which are pieces that we haven't done. Um, we're working on the supersonic aerodynamics with uh, uh, friends of ours at a company called Flowmetrics and also flying some experimental aerodynamic guided stuff, supersonic. Um, motors, uh, our group has fired things from 75 pounds to 35,000 pounds. We have fired a 35,000 pound hybrid motor. I don't personally like hybrids, but I had a customer for that and did that. And um, so it's mostly stand up a business and take all the pieces we've been developing for four years and turn it into a launcher business. Yeah. I've basically been doing this myself, in, you know, self-funding in the several hundred K a year range, developing bits and pieces, and the question becomes, is it now, now the time to turn it into a real startup? And so to date, how high is one of your rocket launches flown? Well, that's an interesting question. My guided vehicle has been to 1,000 feet. My unguided supersonic test vehicles have been to 18,000 feet. That's not very high, uh, but the performance is really about mass fraction. And for the Lunar Lander Challenge, we had the vehicles with the, best, with the lightest mass fraction and the lightest weight um, comparatively. And um, you know, we have to do the development there. One other question for you. So um, what aspect does reusability of your vehicle play on the economics of your flight? Um, and what are you doing for recovery, particularly since you're going to be recovering when, from... Uh, when, when, from I, when I grew up, TVs were repairable. Now, they're th now you can throw them out. The, that was accomplished by making the manufacturing really cheap. I have no recoverability plans at all. The goal is to set up a mostly automated facility to just crank these out at low cost and uh, you know, throw them away. Reusability would be cool. It's really hard. I guess we're good. All right. Um, I think uh, everyone we've seen today are just amazing, amazing companies. I think we should all give them a big round of applause for their, for their great work. And may I predict that the judges are going to have a very, very tough time making a final decision out of those 10 companies. Um, now it's time for lunch. Yeah, we, we invite you all to join us for lunch in the Magnolia Room on the first floor where Eric Anderson will be discussing the plans and future of his company, Planetary Resources. Uh, that is at, I believe, 
one one forty five. Or it starts at twelve fifteen. Yes. See you guys there.